In chess, the knight moves faster around the chessboard than the king, but how much faster exactly? In this video, we're not just going to see a regular old chessboard, we're going to play around with super knights, infinite chessboards, and then use the motivation of this game to connect to some really interesting underlying mathematical ideas and even a new math paper. So in chess, the king moves one square in any direction, and this creates a ring around the king of squares a distance one away. But my favorite chess piece is the knight, which moves in these L-shaped patterns, two squares in one direction, one square in the other, with only horizontal and vertical being allowed. So these eight squares are all one move away for the knight. If I start at any one of those squares and then consider all the possible knight moves from it, I get a list of squares that I need at least two knight moves to get to. And jumping away from all the distance one squares gives me the list of distance two squares. I can fill in the rest of the chessboard with distance three squares, and then for this knight near the middle it turns out that every square can be reached in only four knight moves. But as I move around my starting location, you get all sorts of different patterns on the chessboard. Okay, so how much faster is the knight than the king, exactly? If I choose a starting point and an ending point at random, we can count the number of knight moves and the number of king moves that are required. So in this particular case, it takes three knight moves, but four king moves. And as I change those starting and ending locations randomly, I can compute the average number of king moves and the average number of knight moves. And if I do this over all 64 times 63 possible starting and ending pairs, we get a final average number of king moves being 3.75, and the average number of knight moves being 2.88, for a final ratio that the knight is approximately 1.3 times faster than the king. Cool. But I'm a mathematician more than a chess player, so I'm not satisfied with just an 8x8 board. I'm not satisfied with just these regular old knights, and I want to generalize and see what cool mathematics might be going on behind this. One of the reasons I think larger boards might be interesting is that they avoid some of the dynamics that constrain knights on small boards. Firstly, knights are really constrained at corners, where instead of eight possible moves, they only have two. But anywhere on an edge, or even one square away from an edge, there's a limitation on the number of possible knight moves. And this is the reason for the chess principle that knights are generally better, more centralized in the chessboard. For small boards, edges or one away from an edge makes up a high proportion of the total squares. But if we zoom out to larger boards, these edges make up a smaller proportion of the squares. For infinite boards, there aren't any edges. But more than just edges, the knight is constrained right nearby its starting location. For instance, it takes three knight moves just to move to some of the adjacent squares for a knight. And that's where the king has the advantage. But for more faraway squares, the power of the knight jumps, that's where it starts to shine. Like this point, four squares away horizontally takes four king moves, but only two knight moves. And the bigger the board gets along roughly horizontal paths, the knight moves roughly twice as fast as the king. If you go diagonally, it's not quite as fast. Here it takes two knight moves to move up the diagonal three squares. And so along this diagonal, the knight is three halves as fast as the king. Now, I've actually shown you the best and the worst case lines through large boards. So the true relative advantage of a knight over a king is somewhere between twice as fast as we got for horizontal lines or equally well vertical lines by asymmetry, and the three halves as fast as we got along those diagonals. But where exactly does it end up? I've so far presented this problem in the language of chess. I wanted to bring in just a bit of mathematical formalism into the problem, because a chessboard is nothing but a coordinate system. Instead of squares, you get points, and we have a two-dimensional integer coordinate system that can be infinitely large. And then a chess move can be thought of as just adding points together in the coordinate system. Like if I start at a point 1, 1, and I want to move to a point 3, 2, I can imagine that I'm adding the knight move, which can be decoded by 2-1. This is going to move 2 to the right, 1 up, and get me from 1-1 one, one to 3-2. And then those numbers can be put together in a summation formula in the coordinate system. Now, I want you to imagine I start with some initial set of points. Here I've got the points 2-1 and minus 1, minus 1, and I'm going to label the set A to be the set that has those two points in it. 
this is going to be my starting step, so I'll put a 1 labeling each of these points at stage 1. Now let me add some stage 2 points. These three points I'm going to call the set 2A, and I got them by adding together two things from A. So for instance, 2, 1 plus 2, 1, that gives me 4, 2. Minus 1, minus 1, plus minus 1, minus 1, that gives me minus 2, minus 2. And then the interesting one is that 2, 1 plus minus 1, minus 1, this gives me 1, 0. So this new set 2A is all the ways that I can take two things from A and add them together. Let's keep going. 3A is then all ways that I can take three elements from A and add them together. Or another way of saying this is that 3A adds together an element from 2A and an element from A. And then in general, I will have what I will call HA. This is the sum of H different elements from A. This is called a sum set, and it is going to be the real object of study for the mathematics in this video. The linear algebra students among you might see a vague familiarity with the idea of the span of a set of vectors, but while the span is all linear combinations, a sum set only specifically allows the sum of elements of A with coefficient 1 in front. So let's see some more sum sets. Here we can start with, do you recognize it? Well, it's the eight possible night moves. All the eight ways that you can go two squares in one direction, one square in the other, leaving from the origin. We've seen this cover an ordinary chessboard, but here we can see the 2a, the 3a, and so forth, they nicely cover our space. So this is going to be the real context where we can ask about the relative speeds of different starting sets and their subsequent sum sets as they propagate around our two-dimensional space. Now, sum sets are really cool mathematical objects. I actually had a professor, Askel Kavansky, in graduate school, but I didn't realize this at the time, but one of his papers showed that the size of the sum set HA is given as a polynomial in the number H. But for this video, I'm going to share just a bit from a different paper by Christian Tafula that focuses specifically on sum sets for generalizations of knights. We'll call them super knights. Well, a regular knight goes two squares in one direction, one square in the other. A more general AB super knight goes A squares in one direction and B squares in the other. So this is a two, three super knight, and it walks around the board with jumps of that size. Super knights are helpful to study because they are the smallest set that contains a specific point AB and all of the symmetric variants of it. So they give a very simple but also very symmetric set to consider. Now, not all super knights are interesting. Like the 2-2 two, two super knight that moves two squares in one direction, two squares in another, if it starts on a dark square, it will never get to a light square. It doesn't propagate out to hit the whole two-dimensional space. Boring. In fact, if an AB super knight has a hope of traversing all squares, well, first of all, A plus B better be an odd number so that you can get from the dark squares to the light squares, but there's a second condition that is needed as well. Let's ask whether we can get two squares to the right. If I can do that, by symmetry I could get two squares up, down, to the left, and, and from there to any of the dark squares, and as I just noted, if A plus B is odd, similarly to the light squares. So, I'll illustrate this for the 2, 3 super knight, but I can always go over to the right and amount 2b, or in, in this case 2 times 3 squares, with just 2 moves. I could also move horizontally and amount 2a, or in this case 2 times 2 squares with 2 moves. So doing sequences of moves like that multiple times, I really can get to any location that is an amount 2 times ax plus by to the right that I want. So to specifically get just two squares over, I could do that if I can solve ax plus by equal to 1, which is another way of saying that I need the greatest common denominator of a and b to equal 1. So that's our condition. If a plus b is odd and the greatest common denominator of a and b is equal to 1, then our ab super knight can get to every square on the chessboard. Now, in this paper by Tafula, it explicitly calculates how fast these super knights move around on an infinite chessboard. Here's the formula for a velocity of an AB super knight, and the result depends on the A and B, is given by 2 times A plus B, B squared divided by A squared plus 3B squared. If I plug in 
a equal to 1 and b equal to 2 to get the regular night, then you get the result that the knight is 24 thirteenths times faster than the king. Quite a bit better than the approximately 1.3 that we computed for the 8x8 board, where the constraints from the small board was really slowing the knights down. I'll link the paper in the description if you're interested in the details, but I'll just briefly note the key result that's needed here. Remember how early on we saw that for roughly horizontal movements, the regular knight was twice as fast as the king? Or more generally, for an AB knight where B is the larger size, it would take about X divided by B moves to move X distance to the right. If you go up a bit, that should also be fine. That doesn't really change things. You can slide up a bit while you're going to the right. It doesn't take more moves. So the paper proves that this is actually the case anywhere in the triangle where Y is less than X divided by 2, or more generally for super knights, where Y is less than that ratio of the sides, A divided by B times X. And so in this triangle, the number of moves is just X divided by B. Plus, perhaps an error term of order B. Remember how there's always a little wiggle room like right near the beginning or end of a sequence of moves, but the point is that this error term doesn't grow with X. If X is, a, you know, far away, a million, a billion, it only depends on the fixed value B. So this is a nice estimate in this region. In the next region, which is a little higher, there's a similar result. Now the number of night moves is the ratio of X plus Y to A plus B. So basically now the height Y the other side of the night moves A also matters. And again, there's a small error term of order B. So we have these nice estimates on one eighth of the space via symmetry. You get the same basic estimates everywhere. And then it's a bit of funky counting. I'll let you check out the paper yourself if you're interested to get to that final formula for the velocity in terms of A and B. Now, this video is my first video entirely animated using Python and specifically three blue, one brown's Manum library, which has been a goal of mine for a long time. But I didn't know Python. And so I turned to Brilliant.org to help me learn Python. Now, I've worked with Brilliant in sponsored videos like this one for years now. They're great, but when I share their cool math courses, I do it from the experience of a math professor. But for programming, I'm the noob. And honestly, it was a really fantastic experience. I loved that it was really interactive. Like, I felt that I was in the driver's seat testing out the code and able to go at exactly my own pace through the content. All the lessons carefully built up complexity so that as I was learning more complicated ideas, I'd already well established the basic ideas and syntax and had opportunities to practice them. And so they felt really ingrained. And after about two weeks of learning regularly, on the go, a little each day, my foundation started feeling really solid and I jumped into the project for today's video and a couple thousand lines of code later, here we are. So Brilliant really empowered me to finally learn Python properly and ultimately I found the process quick and effective. So to try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet or click the link down in the description. Clicking that link will give you an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, if you enjoyed this new style of video, let me know in the comments as I'm pretty excited about it. But regardless, we'll do some more math in the next video.